Claudio. We are recording, so welcome, man. Good to have you here. Thank you, and it's a pleasure to be here. It's my first podcast, so let's see how this goes. <laughs> no, this is going to be good. Uh, so obviously, you and I met the other day, and and you know we we chatted quite a bit. And honestly, we could have talked for hours, but I I really wanted to bring you back because, like I said, I'll, I'll you know push this to to a lot of our meetup members and everybody on YouTube because uh, there's some golden nuggets um, from our last conversation and I'm looking forward to our call here. Uh, but hey, before we get started, tell us, um, you know, who you are and your, your, you know, background in real estate and how you got started. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm pretty sure we even talked for hours last time, and so <laughs> uh, we'll keep this one shorter. Uh, but yeah, my name is Claudio Diaz. Um, I'm a local real estate investor. Um, you know, it actually feels great to say that, right, Ennis? I mean, one I day, I, I never thought it could be, you know, my reality, but I made it into my reality. So I'm very blessed for that. <clears throat> um, don't really know too many real estate investors outside of the industry, right? You don't really run into those guys just on a day-to-day -day basis. So uh, I feel very pr privileged to be in this kind of position. But um, yeah, um, you know, I was born in Brazil um, in 1990. So I came here when I was 10 years old in 2000. Uh, my family brought me here. <clears throat> uh, my dad was already here. He was working, you know, um, just trying to, you know, give us a, a better opportunity back at home, sending some money back. And um, we, we made the decision as a family to come over here. And um, my mom wanted to work here as well. She was a school teacher back at home, just a very natural family. You know, a lot of sisters, like my mom's got like seven sisters and brothers, you wow. know, just a big family. Yeah. But um, we never lived near them. You know, we lived in like the, the capital. So they were always like outside the city. So we never really got to see them too often, just, you know, here and there. Um, but so, you know, for me, I guess coming over here wasn't too difficult as far as the, the family side, because um, we were close, but we weren't, we wouldn't see each other that often. So for me, I didn't even realize what I was jumping into when I came here. You know, I thought it was just like a trip. Turns out I lived my whole <laughs> life here, right? Yeah. So that for me was a little bit different. Um, but yeah, went to school up here, learned English, you know, it took me a few years, probably two years to kind of get the English language down. I didn't know anything. Um, I went to like fifth grade here and then sixth, wow. seventh, eighth. Yep. And then, yeah, my dad, you know, decided to go back to Brazil at some point. I think that was 2004. Uh, but me, my mother and, and my sisters, we all stayed here. And then, you know, we just continued working. Um, we were still going to college well, high school at the time. And then we graduated. Uh, we ended up moving. And then from there, you know, just kind of things just kept on going. And we just stayed here, you know, 20 years later. So um, to kind of tell you how things came into play for me was during this whole time, you know, my mother was a single mother, you know, she kind of had to hold it down for, for the whole family. And, you know, for me, I always had to provide for my own self. So it wasn't really asking for, for money for clothes or things like that. So I just always worked, man. I, I started my first job, I think at 16. Yeah. And by the time I was 17, I had like $10,000 in the bank. And that was crazy to me, you know. I never seen that kind of money. Right, um, that was a lot of money, obviously, at that age. Yeah, for sure. And you know, a sixteen-year-old kid wants to have fun, right? Like, I, I'm pretty sure I bought an Xbox. You know, I, I went out, I went to the movies, I like went to restaurants. Like, I just, you know, finally got to live a little bit, right? But um, that's kind of how I got my start in uh, in business in general. Um, just hard working, just got it from from the ground up. And uh, from there, you know, I was going to college. My goal was to be a computer science uh, major, and that took me a few years. I think um, I went to school from 2012 until. No, sorry, it wasn't that long. It was 2011, um, all the way down to, I think, 2015. So it took me a little bit longer to, you know, kind of go through that process. But um, I was just my mind on the on the objective, which is to graduate. And I actually wanted to transfer school and get my bachelor's, but that ended up never happening. Uh, one of the reasons being is that I would just always pay for my school, right? My mom would help me out a little bit here too, maybe pay half of my tuition, which wasn't much. It was like a few thousand. I just went to a local community college, but just between working, you know, and um, trying to, you know, help help out as much as I could, obviously. Uh, that's kind of how I, I had to, you know, just how I lived my life, just trying to survive, I suppose, in a way or another. Yeah. And um, just never had debt, right? That was a cool thing for me. I just was, I just want to want to have any debt. And so that's actually what held me back. And in hindsight, was actually kind of proposed me to be where I am today because I didn't want to go to um, a four-year school because I was going to go from like, you know, three to five grand a semester to like 40,000, you know, a year. So that was a big switch. And I wasn't trying to get yeah. myself into hundreds of thousands of debt. So um, after I kind of was done with my associate's degree, which I never actually ended up graduating, I think I was like two classes short um, or something like that, but it just, the schedule just never, never fitted into place for me to kind of, you know, make the best of it. And so um, during that time is when I really kind of, you know, understood who I was and, and that I just wanted more for myself. And um, luckily I didn't get myself into debt. You know, luckily I didn't go out there and pursue this career, which for me would have been a great play. You know, for me, I would have, I would have been probably making um, I don't know, 75, 80,000 coming out of school, 
figured, you know, two, three years later down the line, I'd be able to get through my debts. And, you know, if I had to do it right, I would have done it for two years, which wouldn't have been too terrible. But even then, um, yeah. it just seemed like too much. And um, other than that, I mean, just um, was trying to figure it out. And that was the time for me where where things really kind of, you know, set in place because I wasn't sure if I wanted to continue, you know, the school route. Yeah. I, I was kind of halfway there already. Um, but I also didn't know if I if I loved it enough for me to keep going. And um, and that was the time when I was working at the bank, which is what, actually when I met you, you know, I was kind of taking like a year just to kind of regroup myself, learn right. a little bit about the finance industry. I was figuring like, hey, I see two people with money, finance people and uh, real estate people. So I wasn't sure which route I wanted to go. But I started there, you know, started to learn about financial literacy, which is something that was not ever thought in school. Um, I was always good with money, but I just never knew how to actually, you know, make it, multiply it, right? Things like that. And so uh, I started learning like Rich Dad, Poor Dad. I think you know about that very well. Uh, books yeah. like that. Yeah, I love Dave it. Dave Ramsey. All right. Yeah, Dave Ramsey. And just, you know, just kind of got started in that and just a whole lot of YouTube um, yeah. when, I wasn't, when I wasn't at the job and just obviously working at the bank, right? You get to see what everybody does and kind of seeing like who's who and kind of you get to see some patterns, right? In thinking and and uh, in different professions. And for me, real estate really stuck out. And I know for sure at the time uh, you were one of the few customers that was in this business, which I had kind of learned a little bit about online. You know, I had kind of piqued my interest. I was learning about it. Um, somebody else at the bank wanted me to get my license. Like, hey, man, you should be a realtor. You know, I just sold a house. I made six grand. I'm like, oh, wow, that's pretty cool. You know, I could probably sell a house a month, right? Or something like that. And mm -hmm you know, supplement my income. But um, just that's kind of how it started, man. I started looking into real estate. And um, I said, you know, uh, I'm, I'm definitely don't want to be in the finance industry, because it's very stressful. And yeah. uh, looking at like the guys that are really making a lot of money in that industry. I mean, they're working like 70, 80 hours and just, just really grinding, you know what I mean? And I wasn't, that wasn't the lifestyle that I was going for either. So that's kind of how my story went. Awesome. I, I appreciate all that. The, the one thing, and I haven't told you this before, one thing that's, you know, stood out to me when I saw you at the bank, obviously we, we, you know, we work with a couple of banks. Yeah. Uh, but um, when I used to come to, to the bank that you worked, it's like, regardless of you know, the fact that you got into real estate, I learned that later, you were always, you know, smiling, always uh, super polite. And, and that goes, honestly, that t says a lot about somebody, you know, uh, you Thank had, you. I mean, you know, there was a bunch of other people there and to them, I was just another customer, but you were like always mm -hmm. asking a question, you know, very presentable. And that stood out compared to everybody else that, that I've met there or at other banks. So that, Thank you. Um, that shows, you know, that definitely shows your character and, and personality, but uh, yeah, uh, I mean, that, that was, that's a good story. And, and then, you know, you guys reached out to me, right. You and a colleague, and you guys wanted to know more about um, how to get involved. And uh, you came to our office one day and, you know, obviously I was happy to see you guys, but I'm like, these guys are probably not going to, you know, take my advice or do anything else with it. Uh, as much yeah. as I wanted you guys to really be involved of in course. it, I, I just, I, I thought that, um, the, the bank, you know, that, that uh, the check they were get, getting there was too comfortable to really kind of, you know, uh, let go and, and uh, kudos to you. You know, you kind of um, just yeah. it really, it really took off. So t tell me about that. So what, that. yeah, t tell me about where you at now uh, and then we'll get into a specific deal that you have done. Um, yeah. And, and I mean, the, the, the funny thing is, right, and as you would think I'd be making money working at the bank, I mean, it was just really enough to cover the bills because here in right. Boston, living is very expensive, right? So it really wasn't enough to um, kind of keep me off my off my comfort zone. But hey, I definitely was locked in and I remember that meeting and I definitely appreciate you for that because I think you were one of those figures in my early career that kind of really stood out that, um, hey, like, hmm, there's really something here because, uh, you know, you start putting the pieces of together and you're like man i know for sure like i mean for sure i wasn't seeing the kind of checks that you, you know you were bringing with anybody else right uh wires or not like regardless uh, i was always keeping an eye on all the customer transactions just to you know maximize opportunities <laughs> right. yeah. and like i said i i knew realtors and they were not pulling up like that either right and so yeah uh you know man i'm, I'm like yeah look I, this seems like a very real industry let me see what a transaction actually looks like and yeah. um that's kind of how it started man but i was already locked in at that point um, I really wanted to make the switch happen. Um, I want to say that um, kind of one of the one of the first things that stood out to me was like how hard it was going to be because um, it was, wasn't too long after that we had our first list. Uh, we started cold calling it. Um, a lot of wrong numbers in that list, uh, but we still kept calling and just got nothing out of it. And I was like, wow, this is like mission impossible, you know? Right. So I'm thinking like I need to get a bigger list. I need to skip trace more contacts, which, you know, it was only a few hundred numbers in there. So it wasn't too many. Uh, but we kept going, man, and like nothing really came off of it until 
um, I was talking to one person, um, one of my colleagues, just like a random person. And um, they, they found an opportunity where somebody had a car stored in a, in a house, right? Which turned out to be that lead that we looked at into. Um, and that was like my first upfront encounter with like a real deal because right. that, up until that point, I hadn't really found anything hot like that. Right. And I was always scared about the market because the houses here are so expensive, right? People are talking about, oh, you need to get a 70% off deal. I mean, how can I get a house worth 500,000, 30% off? I'm thinking like, that's the drastic difference, right. you know? And why and what hard. what goes through your mind is like why would somebody even accept that offer right right and that's right. like the first barrier it's like our, the first barrier it's it's actually us it's in our minds like why would somebody take like a 30 percent discount um, yeah it didn't make sense but it but it was happening right and i was absolutely. seeing it all around me because like i said once i started getting obsessed with it i was just learning and learning and learning i started following everybody so now i'm seeing on stories i'm seeing it like real real time effectively and so yeah that that one deal and it's you know um I, we probably could have made like forty thousand on that right absolutely. which is crazy to me um yeah. but hey that was what i was probably making a year uh working at the bank so it wasn't a whole lot but like that was enough to do that. Hey, if I can just do one of these a year, man, I'll at least be okay. Right. And I don't even need any much. I just need my freedom and and the ability to keep, you know, more uh, coming at the bat, basically, right? Showing up once, once time and time and time again. So, so that was kind of like how I first got into it. But we ended up not getting that deal. Uh, yeah. it, was, it turned out to be an REO, right? Like the yeah, they just wouldn't accept a short sale, right? Which, um, with hard hard money loan. So that's something that we learned. Uh, and we kept going, but that was fine. Not a big deal at all. We got, but, um, we got really close on that one, but uh, definitely a yeah. learning, learning experience. Um, yeah. So from that to where you at now, so tell me about what does your business look like? Obviously it's out of state uh, yeah. at this point. Uh, yeah. So tell me about that a little bit. Yeah. So things really took off from there. I mean, at that point I was like, man, I was too close to ever give up. And, you know, it wasn't too long after that. And as I'll tell you, like I said, you know what, even if I quit this business, I'm going to have at least done one or two deals. I, I'm not going to quit before I ever get to that point. And uh, the more I got into it, the more I actually started enjoying it. It was the first time in my life that I guess I could do whatever I wanted to do and um, was able to put myself in a position where like, hey, this, this business rewards you as much as you're willing to work it, right? So I really like that. I really like that ability to not be capped out at a given position or something like that. So it kind of went from there. Later on now, a um, couple of years later now, it wasn't too long ago, right, Ennis? It was only a few years um, but two years later, I um, uh, have a team, you know, it's me and two other partners. We're virtual. One of my partners is in Houston. Uh, that's my buddy, Ronnie. And then I have another partner, Troy. Um, he handles the uh, disposition, the cash, um, you know, the, the private money and yeah. the hard money loans. And uh, he actually did a few fix and flips of his, of his own. So he has that experience to bring on the table. And then my partner, Ronnie, is more like the acquisitions, boots on the ground. He's the only actual partner in Houston. Uh, my partner, Troy, is in Dallas. But yeah, we're virtual in Texas. Uh, I don't do any deals here. I've actually never done a deal local, which is interesting, but probably something I want to add to my to my trophy. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Um, but yeah, so now we're doing like anywhere from two to five deals a month. Uh, it's nothing crazy, but like if you actually know how this business goes, I mean, you only really needed like one deal a month, right? Realistically speaking, all, just starting all. out. Yeah. If you can do one deal a month, I mean, you're, you're getting paid better than a doctor and, and his wife probably, right? So, <laughs> so yeah, it's right. crazy like that. So how... So you guys are in, in Houston, right? Is that the market? Yeah. You're okay. So tell Primarily. me, tell me about lead generation and, um, you know, I was going to go into what type of tools you guys use. I'm really, um, I, I follow you obviously on social media. So I know you're, you, you know, you got some really uh, good tools that you use, but, um, and then maybe we'll jump into one specific deal, you know, just like, yeah. you know, how much you purchased sure. it for or what did you go under agreement for, you know, just uh, how sure. much you made, whatever you can tell us, obviously something that we, you know, yeah. I can learn from or anybody watching this. Yeah, for sure. Um, so definitely I'm, I'm on social media. I'm pretty active with the community. I think networking is one of the biggest, uh, most powerful ways that you can start in this business. Just getting yourself a community of people to support you like you did, you yeah. know, I went to some of your, your meetups, which was great. So I definitely appreciate that in this. Uh, but yeah, to tell you some of the tools that we're using in our business, um, so we do things a little bit differently over here because we are a small team, but we are pretty powerful. Um, we're all like really great on the phone acquisitions wise. We're not, you know, we've done plenty of sales training. Um, we don't ever walk into an appointment or a call feeling like we're not the best solution for the seller. We always have to be very ethical. That's one thing for us too that really stands out. Uh, if we put a house on the contract, we are going to close it no matter what. Uh, we've never had to back out of a deal so far. So, you know, I'm, I'm happy about those, those statistics. We've had a few drop out. Right. But that just yeah. comes with the territory. Absolutely. Uh, but, as, but as far as tools and sort of, sort of the things that make us really um, do well in this business is 
obviously I'm virtual, right? So I can't go to the properties. Uh, I got I got to pivot. One of the reasons why is like I said, the price point here was really, you know, it made me a little bit uncomfortable yeah. with actually, you know, getting people to commit like that. And I went to a few appointments here, but then the issue was traffic. I was like, I never want to be stuck in traffic ever again, trying yeah. to go to an appointment an hour, two hours. So, um, so yeah, that was the first decision. Once we went virtual, um, my goal was to be a lead generation person, right? Because I can't go to appointments. Uh, I just got to try to generate as many leads as possible, try to talk them into it. And then when they're ready to meet with us, I'll send my partner Ronnie down there and he can, you know, lock them up uh, in person and kind of do that part. And then I'll find the cash buyers on my end if I need to. But um, one of the most powerful tools for sure is REI Sift. That's kind of like the core hub of um, our business. And I would actually recommend anybody listening to this to definitely go ahead and download it. I mean, you're losing money uh, without even knowing it, without that software, which is interesting to say. Uh, there's not a whole lot of softwares out there that do something that um, is unique, uh, but REI SIFT is definitely unique in its own proposition. Reason being is that you're able to have a core hub of where all your data lives. So you know exactly, um, you know, you're able to build campaigns, you're able to see how many people, how many times you've reached out to somebody, if you've actually got gotten through to that person, because a lot of times, you know, you make a hundred calls, maybe 10 people pick up and then not even, you know, you're not even going to get one lead sometimes. So you just, it's just a numbers game, right? But um, if you keep hitting that person over and over again, even if you have the good numbers, you're never going to get a hold of that person if they're deceased, if they're, you know, no longer available or something like that. So, so it really lets you hone in on on who you're reaching and who you're not reaching. Mm -hmm. Um, That way you're able to sort of deep prospect the people that you're not reaching and actually see where, what's going on with that because they still have a house, right? They still have a problem. And uh, just because you haven't gotten them on the phone doesn't mean that uh, that problem is going away. But I know for sure that if I call somebody within 10 different numbers, or maybe I skip trace it two places and I still don't have any good numbers, that gets me wondering, right? Like, is anybody really speaking with this person? So right. that's the power of REI SIFT. Um, we spend most of our time there. It doubles as a CRM. And uh, we're able to go and um, execute on a strategy that we really, um, we're really having a lot of success with. I don't see a lot of people executing on the strategy. Um, it really only comes from REI SIFT and, um, and the creator, Tyler Austin. He put this, you know, this great education system around it to actually learn how to leverage that software. Um, so we're doing something called Go No Go, which we kind of talked about a little bit. Um, yeah. That's really, yeah, that's really the secret sauce if there's anything cl- that comes close to it. Uh, you got to just hard, you know, work hard in this business. There's really, you know, there's no handouts, right? Can't, yeah, uh, can't give up after, after you know, a little bit, right? You just got to go no. and, and, and... You just got to push. You got to yeah. push. Uh, yeah. Before we go into that go, no go, and what that really means, um, sure. do you, where do you pull your list? Yeah, so that's the thing, right? Uh, REI SIFT kind of gives you a great foundation as far as like your thinking around data. So data for us is very important because it lets us know who to target and when yeah. to target them. And like, um, if somebody tells you, no, you don't want to call that person again, right then and there, because you're spending money as well, just right. constantly hitting the wrong prospects. Yeah. So there's a lot of money to be had in just actually talking to the best people, uh, at any given time. So as far as, um, uh, I'm sorry, what was your question? The, as far as the list goes, I, yeah, cause I'm, I'm not list. sure if the REI SIFT actually provides you guys with lists. They you know? don't. Okay. They so, don't, yeah. so you but have to go to a different source. Data. Yeah, so they don't provide just with any data, but they do give you the hub. So I get my data from mainly the county. I think that's really the best source. The county knows best. Um, They know who's paying the taxes and who's not. So we like to get a tax delinquent from the county, you know, just a quick email um, over to the county official. You just got to find out who that is in your county. Uh, We get a lot of code violations lists. Uh, We try to pull the tax delinquent once a year or twice a year just to be sure, but um, the code violation, you want to get that monthly. That's kind of like a driving for dollars list because if there's overgrown grass, you would have tagged it as driving for dollars, right? right? It's kind of the same thing a lot of times or if there's a trash outside. Trash or, outside, um, yeah. cars, Anything. whatever, right? You know? Yeah. 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 Um, so other than county data, I mean, we get data from PropStream just because it's readily available. Uh, it's not our you know main focus, but we use it as insight. So I look at that as insight, not necessarily is it good data or bad data. You know, I look at it like, hey, you're telling me it's in pre-foreclosure. I can only go by that, right? Yeah. We'll see when we call that. Propstream.com. That's that's another you know website, and we use that in our business. Yeah. So Propstream is great. Um, yeah. So you you know you go on um, the county, um, mm-hmm. and, and you know in our area it's a little different, but obviously even here you can get all you know you can get code violations, you can get tax delinquent. Uh, yeah. you can get water shot off. Those water are, the, you know, one. the fire list. I know it's good has been performed, has performed well for us. And these are lists that are, it's a little harder to get, right? It's not, yeah. um, it's easy. not right there. 
Yeah, right. But uh, that that limits the number of investors or or people that are getting it. So yeah, uh, if you get that list now, you can you can um, take that you know upload it on REI Sift and, and run with it, right? Um, exactly. Exactly. At that point, so you are only focused on call calling. You're not doing any direct mail to that list, right? Uh, not yet. Um, okay. It's technically in there. It's just like it's so far back into the cycle that we don't even we've never even had to send out a single mail piece just yet. I mean, we can. Uh, we just really there's just too many good opportunities for us to even be sending mail. Uh, but we'd like to send like targeted mail if we were to. Yeah. You know, it's just that we're not doing it right now. But like if I see somebody like, you know, it makes sense to send them a mail piece. I have an address that of somebody that I can't get a hold of. But typically, there's so many family relatives that we're talking to Got to it. get around to finding that person that may be deceased or something like that, that ultimately we just don't have to get, you know, uh, send mail. But I think mail is a great wow. strategy. Yeah. Yeah. So you are pretty much taking the list, adding into REI Sift and just call calling them. And uh, yeah. as far as keep tracing, Claudia, who, who does that for you guys? Yeah. So we use a few different providers. Um, it depends on kind of the purpose for it. So when we put the data in REI SIFT, you know, and we're able to basically filter it down, we'll see who the best prospects to start off with. You know, we want to go ahead and cold call those people on a, on a single line dialer. Uh, we don't want to be on a 10 line or a three line dialer. I know it seems like redundant to not use the, the time, but we, um, what happens is when you're calling, you're only going to get people that answer potentially become leads. So people that are not answering, those are also leads. It's just that you don't know that yet. Um, so yeah, we're doing cold calling line by line. We're doing like maybe a hundred dollars a day each, which is not a lot, but it actually takes a fair amount of time to be able to go through that many numbers. Yeah. Because like I said, you'll call five numbers and then, okay, didn't work. Okay. Let me try maybe a different skip trace or maybe, you know, let me see, talk to a relative and then you get somebody. So it does take a little bit of time to add up. But as far as like um, skip tracing those A1 premium um, prospects, we want to go ahead and get the best just because we know we're going to go ahead and just call them on one on one. We know they're deceased. We know that, you know, this property has been completely just left. Uh, you yeah. know, there's no, there's been nobody here for a long time. So for that, we like uh, skip genie, skip genie.com. Yeah, that's probably like the, the number one most premium skip, single skip, I would say. Yeah, it's not really meant for volume. Um it gives you a hundred skip traces a month for basically what would be 58 cents a skip. So it's a pretty pricey skip, yeah. but after the hundred, it only, it's only like 17 cents. So if you're doing just a bunch of endless single skips, it's going to be probably like 20 to 30 cents blended cost. Uh, but aside from that, let's say we get the code violation list, a tax delinquent, and we want to skip trace like 2000 or 4,000 people or whatever that is, you know, uh, we want to send it over to skip matrix. That's who I'm finding the best results with. Um, you can talk to Mike Colburn over there. He's a really great guy. Um, their data is really on point. They give you associates numbers. So even if the original numbers are no good, like I said, it's not necessarily the provider. It's just the situation, right? They might have provided them the correct landline, but that person's passed away or something like that. Or maybe they, you know, fell off the map somehow. So, so we'll call ahead. The, you know, for people the that don't know what skip tracing really means, what just briefly, what what, what is skip yeah. tracing? Yeah, skip tracing is one of those things that you learn as soon as you get into the business. <laughs> Basically, you have a list, right, of prospects of people that have properties. You want to get a hold of them. Um, so we go ahead and get that list together and we send it over to a provider that uh, is able to get us phone numbers for that list. Um, and those phone numbers are very in quality, very much so. I mean, some of the cheaper skip tracing services will get you like 30% accuracy. Some of the, the medium ones, maybe 50 to 60. The good ones are like 60 to 70, maybe even like up to 80%. Even if they give you like a 95, 97% hit rate, that just tells you they, they came back with numbers. Doesn't mean those numbers are right. But uh, typically, like a very good skip trace service will get you like in the 70 to 80 percent range of, yeah. of accuracy. And, yeah. and it's costly. And that's kind of one of the biggest things for us. And it's like in the beginning, you know, we didn't have thousands of dollars to be able to skip trace like a huge gigantic list, you know, right. pay for a dialer and just be over there calling, you know, day in and day out. Like we still had to go to work. Right. So time was limited. Money was limited. So we just had to uh, be efficient with the skip tracing that we had. Um, and you'll waste a lot of money on bad data. I know for sure we, we spent a little bit of money, you know, incorrectly, but for the most part, we're very vigilant about that and always kept, them, uh, kept an eye on the numbers. But yeah, I think um, Skip Matrix is one of the best. Skip Gene is great for single skips. Awesome. Other than that, I would also recommend um, uh, if you want to do like massive volume, just you want to get some good numbers on the board. Um, I have a buddy, Josh Chan. He has like a data company. He's able to get like 30% for like two to three cents. So if you really just want to, target blanket target a lot of numbers that's probably a good place to start got it awesome now that's 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 a lot of different tools and um you know obviously data is the most important thing right i mean you can you know you can throw money at a list but um if you really yeah. want to get some good results back you got to get that 
good list first, get the good skip tracing components. So you get some uh, good phone numbers and, and then you got to put the work. I mean, you know, I know people, yeah. obviously you got the time now. So you're investing time more than you're investing money at this point, you know, in your business. But um, even if you do direct mail, like I do, you still need to have a great, great list. There's no question about it. Um, yeah. So REI sift prop stream.com skip skip genie and skip metrics i think those are good tools for for people to go check absolutely. out absolutely um, like if you're just driving by a house you see something ugly just skip genie that one you know or find somebody that within an account i mean it's worth it right you um, should be skip tracing at least 100 people a, a month so that should be worthwhile but uh, yeah i mean awesome uh, data is going to be definitely a bottleneck in your business if you don't pay attention yeah and if you don't really get good data or know where to find it right that's that's huge um mm -hmm. Hey, let's go over one particular deal. Um, yeah. You know, just like this, you know, story, how you guys found it, how do you get in under your agreement? Uh, I know your exit strategy for these deals right now, it's wholesaling. I know you want to do some, you know, down the road, maybe some fix and flip, but for now you guys are 100% wholesaling, right? Primarily, yeah. Primarily, and we yeah. did just join um, Pace, uh, Pace's mentorship. So we just nice. joined them last, last week. So we're in the subject to mentorship. So we should be awesome. doing some creative deals here pretty shortly uh yeah i can definitely tell you a little bit about yeah. a deal that we've just done actually yeah um we talked about this deal a little bit briefly when i was at the office uh, we're actually closing on that tomorrow we should have closed it friday it got pushed today fingers crossed I'll, I'll wait until this goes on record before we release this <laughs> i <laughs> yeah, don't want to jinx it <laughs> yeah no we know how it goes right on this um so the, the reason i want to talk about that deal is because it kind of like highlights what i'm doing and sort of what the okay. rs uh, movement or whatever you want to call it is about and how it can be powerful uh, no matter what you're doing so we had this one lead in our system it was from a code violation uh, list from uh, may 29 uh, may 2020 so it was, wow, a, it was already a, it a was year already ago old list, a year ago yeah wow. um, and that was just for having disabled cars in the in the back right in the, in the front yeah and here and that's one thing about houston they have a very strict code violation uh, like standards which is great so, yeah and which is guys. great for us yeah anything comes up it, it flags right um, and it's a free list, right? That's, there you go, talking about like leveraging your money and time, get a, a, you know, the best quality for the, for the least amount of money. You can't beat that. Yeah. So that deal was in our system and we had cold called it, right? But they didn't pick up. Um, I looked at the dialer. We had called them like four or five times. They had never picked up, but we had called. We had put in the time on the dialer. Uh, but it wasn't until we were doing some driving for dollars, which that's something that we always did throughout time. We've always been building a driving for dollars list. And I do it virtually, right? So one thing about that is you want to make sure the Google Maps are updated because if it's like four or five years older, uh, it's not really going to be too useful. You're going to waste probably some time. Mm -hmm. uh, but in Houston, they're mostly like a year to two years um, outdated. So that's actually pretty reasonable. You know, car, uh, houses don't get outdated like overnight. So yeah. if a house looks bad two years ago, it probably still looks like that. Yeah. And then if you check the last sale date, hasn't changed, you know, you've got yourself a great opportunity, you know, for somebody to talk to. So, yeah, so we were driving, driving for dollars. And uh, I tagged this one property and I uploaded it into RES Sift. And now what happens is this, this property was already in there. So now you have uh, the same property address that's on two different lists. So it became stacked, right? Which I'm sure you know what that is. But for anybody listening, it just means that it's a prospect that's on multiple lists, right? Two lists, three lists, whatever the case may be. So they're on the driving for dollars list. And they're on the code violation list, which is, you know, very desirable. There's a lot of distress there. Um, so I see that as soon as it stacked, it entered our, our campaign. And once it entered our campaign, we're able to see that, um, you know, I just kind of, I was looking at it. I was like, hmm, this looks like a pretty, you know, crappy house. And I hadn't talked to them. I didn't have any records of talking to them. Of course, later I went back to the dialer and saw that, you know, we had actually called them multiple times, but we had never actually spoken with that person. So we called them and sure enough, they wanted to sell. I mean, they had some bad tenants there. And, um, and it wasn't too long before we were on the contract. I think we were following up for, I mean, well, they were always uh, answering us, right? But I think it took actually like three months to get it on the contract. Uh, I know we're talking to them back as far as um, Thanksgiving. Hey, just want to wish you a happy Thanksgiving. You know, I know you guys been whatever, right? Just always being that person there for them. That was yeah. really powerful. And uh, we just kept following up. And meanwhile, all these other investors showing up to the party, right? Hey, it's going about the house. And, and people are going to call your leads, right? Of course. Uh, everybody's calling the same, the same property addresses. That's one thing that uh, the new guys need to understand as well, is you're all calling the same list. It's just about timing and consistency. Uh, so yeah, eventually um, they were making lowball offers and they really liked how we were following up with them. And, you know, it came time to, it came to a point where the house hadn't been sold for a price that they wanted. And the husband and the wife were just getting so frustrated about it that I said, you know what, let's, let's call, let's call Claudia and Ronnie. You know, they've been really great. They've been asking how we're doing this whole time. I want to go with them. And that's kind of what created the opportunity in the first place. So 
once we added it to drive for dollars, it became stacked. It entered into the marketing again. And now we see that as a, a higher value prospect. And then we actually executed on that bulletproof follow-up. We didn't miss a single follow-up. Um, and yeah, so then they, you know, went under contract, took another month to get the tenants out. They were very like, they did not want to get out of there. It was very difficult. Uh, we sent them eviction notices, didn't, you know, just going through the process because we we're going to have to evict them, you know, legally, but luckily we didn't have to get to that point. Uh, we we're trying to get them a new place to move into. So that was another problem that we solved for them. We helped them with that. We paid for the towing of all the, like the five disabled cars on the yeah. driveway. Uh, we, we got like two, two tow truck drivers on, on closing day, you know, literally to get those cars out last minute because they, they said they were going to do it, but you know, it was a little bit, Man, behind, right? you said so much in there. Holy yeah. smokes. You, 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 was you, there was a lot of good stuff there. So you, you mentioned yeah. time and consistency. That's huge, right? Um, you know, cause yeah. everybody can call a lead once and, and make an offer or, or whatever. Say, Hey, can you, can you, uh, can we buy this from your, can, can I give you a cash offer? But you guys followed up. Right. Uh, and then that was next, you know, following up and being consistent. You said bulletproof follow-up and, and you say yeah. it now um, to you, it's, it's, you know, it's second nature, game. it's part of the deal, but you know, a lot of people don't have that follow-up in place, right? That follow-up system. So 90% of our deals are done on follow-up. Very rarely people accept on, on the first uh, uh, yeah. time around. So yeah, even time and consistency, deal. that's huge. Yeah. Follow-up, you have that system in place. That's extremely, extremely important. You, you mentioned building a report. You said, hey, I followed up. They liked you guys. Well, that, that's super important because they ended up working with you guys because mm -hmm. they liked and trust you, right? Yeah, um, of course. And the last thing you added value. I mean, you know, you, you mentioned, the, you know, the, the tenants, but I know there's multiple things there where you guys added value and you focused on that, right? By providing a solution to their problems. That's huge, man. So those, yeah. just a few points, just a few things sure. that you mentioned, but they're extremely, you know, you guys did that really well. And obviously you got a, a deal done. Um, what, how, just curious on price negotiation. How did that go? Cause I, you know, it blows my mind yeah. that you can get all this done over the phone in, in Massachusetts yeah. and there in Texas. Yeah. So for <laughs> us, you know, um, everybody was already lowballing. So that's one strategy when you have really great rapport and you have the right prospect. It's not going to be for everybody, right? Yeah. But uh, when they get upset because these people don't know their numbers, they're not. That's the thing, right? There's a lot of amateurs, right? A lot more amateurs. And a lot of, absolutely. Yeah. So you want to be like a professional, no matter if you've never even done your first deal. You want to be like, hey, we'll definitely take care of you here. I mean, what were you looking to do? You want to understand what they want to do, right? And uh, we understood also leveraging data that that wasn't the only property they had. Um, as soon as that becomes a lead, you know, we start to look more into it. We go on prop stream, we're running comparables. And uh, we see that they actually had like three or four other properties. One of them was like a commercial property. Wow. But um, so, yeah, we understood that, you know, and, uh, you know, and during that point, we also say like, I know you have some other properties too. Like, yeah, we have a few, you know, rentals. And so we're understanding the, the, the client, right? We're understanding the tenant and what are they looking to do? How are they in that situation where the property is just, I mean, they've been renting them for a long time and they weren't paying rent for like six months. I have to take care of my customer, which is my seller. Um, but I also have to take care of the, the tenant, right? And my cash buyer and everybody else that's around me. Um, so that was that. I, Claudia, I lost you there for a quick second. Sorry, I think I was on you. Um, yeah, I was just saying, I mean, it's like, we, as far we, as giving them a price though, did you, did they, did yeah. they actually give you a price uh, or, yeah, or so, cause I, I like the strategy so far. You, it looked like you guys didn't really just call and say, Hey, I'm, you know, I'm looking no. to give you X amount of dollars. You had a ton of no. questions for them first. Yeah. We never talk price. So we try to avoid that conversation as far as late as it has to be, it has to happen at that point. Right. It's kind of like, it. are we going to do business? Are we not? But up until then, it's just rapport and understanding and following up. So yeah, we um, we didn't even need to make a hard offer because everybody else had already showed up like amateurs and made very low offers. Um, and so when all these offers start coming in at a certain point, the sellers think that that's a good price and they're just ready to get out of the house. So they did. They wanted, um, I think they wanted like 63 and the highest offer was like 57, right? But they didn't really want to work with those guys. So he's like, hey, Ronnie, uh, if you can do 63, like we'll go with you guys. So, That's amazing. And it was funny is you never want to make it seem sweet because if it's sweet, they're also going to get uh, cold feet during the process. And then that deal is not going to go through. So, you know, we, we learn um, um, sales acquisition techniques. So we're like, ah, I mean, uh, is that the best price you can really do? I, I'm just not sure I can do that. I mean, I probably have to talk to my partner about that. I mean, I don't think we're too far, but uh, I mean, would you be even be able to do like 60,000? Yeah. Right. So we're trying to just get a little bit more out of it. Um, yeah. And it's like, ah, probably, but the husband, he was really adamant. He was ready to go with the higher price. 
but you know we started um disqualifying those other guys i mean hey that's completely underst- you know understandable we want to make sure you guys get the highest money i just can only give you what i can give you but at the same time you know i just want to make sure that you're taken care of uh just make sure that you're asking those guys to put on a you know at least a two thousand dollar earnest money deposit and things of that sort and that's when so you're like, educating they- them on the process yes absolutely and so the next day i mean they the lady called the wife called us and she's like ronnie when can you come over i, I want to get this done we came over that same night, 7 p.m., you know, after work, and uh, we, and we locked it down. And that was that. And that was uh, awesome. a deal for 63000 and we ended up assigning it for 27000 So 27000 on top of that. So wow. we sold it for, I think, 90000 90000 yeah. Uh, that, that was a good deal. So uh, did you guys know that actually there was a buyer or that the market can support 90000 or did that come later? Uh, we just know our market. One thing that's funny about Texas is uh, it's a non-disclosure state, so there's no way to see cash comps. So, like, that's oh. one more thing that separates the professionals and the amateurs because the amateurs are going to kind of go just lower to be safe. The professionals are going to give a little bit more money, but yep. they're going to be in a, at a better price point, right? Which you got to think about that. It's not just about getting the, the biggest deal. It's just about getting, you know, volume at the same time. Yeah. So, yeah, we did that. Um, we know that the ARV was 170 and we were seeing some comps going up above like 180 for like an extra bedroom or something. So we're pretty safely at 160. So then I know I got to be at, at least 80 max. I always look at um, buying anything for 50% off. That, that tells you like the initial starting point every time. Um, the market's very hot in Houston. I mean, it's absolutely hot right now. It's on fire. And um, we know we can find buyers at any given zip code pretty much. Claudia, so you went with, uh, so you said, you know, let's take the 160 as the ARV. So how did you... Yeah. Uh, is that a 70% rule? How did you come up with, with the 80? Yeah. Just curious. So we don't like the 70% rule. Uh, we feel that it's outdated. Sure. You could change up that 70 to like 0.75. I think that's more accurate. Yeah. And then, you know, anywhere from like 0.75 to 0.78, you're probably at a good point minus repairs, right? Minus your assignment fee. Uh, but once we found out the comps, it was like around 160 to 170, depending on, you know, cause they also had an illegal uh, bedroom. They converted the garage into a bedroom. Got but it. we're thinking like, that's probably not going to go fly. So we're going to run our comps space on a three, two. And uh, we did that. Um, and yeah, so we, we just do our, our, our method that works for us. And honestly, it's been working great because every time we look at the numbers in hindsight, it seems to be exactly where we needed to be. Uh, so what we do is ARV, find out what the ARV is. Um, and then we also have MLS access. So that helps us when we look at prop stream and, uh, and MLS, which is HAR.com over there, the Houston, yeah. um, MLS. So we take out uh, right away off the bat, we multiply it by 0.92. So that takes out 8% from the sales and that's going to cover like realtor commissions and the cash closing um, from up front, right? So that okay. takes out some, some costs from the deal. Okay. And then, okay, cool. The realtors got paid. Now, how much is it to fix the house? Well, we estimate repairs, you know, anywhere from like $15 to $25 uh, per square foot, maybe $30 a square foot if it's like a total rehab. And I know for you guys, that seems like super cheap. <laughs> yeah, I, wish, right? I can't believe that. I wish that was like that in Boston. Yes. Yeah. yeah. More, here, but, here is more like a hundred bucks, you know, if it's a small single family, got you know, rehab. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, 25 so that, 30 you said right if it's full gut rehab so you know yeah, like you know those numbers scratch. and that's also you know i want to point that out kudos to you guys because that shows that you are prepared and you know what you're talking about because you know yeah. uh, somebody around here can get a wholesale and they have no idea what the rehab will cost you know right uh, but as an investor if you know what the rehab will cost and you know the ARV, the after repair value, mm-hmm. uh, I mean, now, now you know what you're talking about. So you are actually delivering a property yeah. to, to a builder buyer uh, that has meat on the bone, but you're also making, you know, $27,000 on that deal. Exactly. Because uh, we're wholesalers, right? Our clients, yes, I want to say it's the seller, but it's really the buyer. The buyer is the one that's going to pay me and the one the one's actually purchasing the, the product, which the product is a, an investment deal, investment opportunity. So yeah, you take out the repair cost. You know, we assumed it would have been like right away 30 grand. Once we went to the, uh, once we actually got access, which was a few weeks later, cause it was very difficult to get access. We ended up working with the tenants. They let us come in one time yeah. and uh, man, the house looked absolutely horrible. Like missing the, like the, you know, the ceiling on it. Um, everything was like, like if, if you see the pictures, Dennis, you'd be like, wow, this is insane. But it's not the only the only house. I mean, there's so many houses in the Houston market that look like that. Um, it's a phenomenal market. I mean, there's so many opportunities. But yeah, once we take that out, we take out what the flipper wants to make, which we need to calculate that as well, right? So I think an average deal, like an average good deal is 15% return. Um, but that's even a little bit high. I mean, a lot of people go by like 13%, you know, like a, like a general good deal. But we even try to aim like what's 20% of ARV? Like what would that number be? 
So then you say, okay, that's like 30 grand. Or if you do 15%, you see that's like, oh, that's like 22 grand. So you can easily say an investor wants to make 25 to 30K, right? Okay. So it doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to be ballpark. So you put that in there, you put the 30, you put another 25 to 30. So you're like, okay, that's, you know, 160 minus, you know, 60, right? You're like, okay, I got to be somewhere at an assignment price of around 100. So I'm thinking I got this thing at a 63 price. Jeez. I mean, it could be yeah, a room there for a profit. Awesome. How yeah. did you actually decide on that 90,000? Is that what the buyer actually offered or you guys, that was your number? Or I'm just curious how you handle yeah. that. So we had a, we like to build VIP relationships uh, just because we want to have these buyers that just consistently come to us because they hate working with everybody else. And uh, this is like this, um, this lady, she does a lot of flips uh, and her daughter wanted to get into the business and she's already been kind of, you know, through the process a few times with the mother. And uh, so she wanted to get her own first flip and, she, and the mother was gonna fund. So they weren't too too stringent on the price. We had an open house, you know, with a few buyers just one time. Uh, wow. We were able to get a one little window of time for them to come in and, and look at it. Once, you know, they already had the pictures but they wanted to go ahead and see it in person. So they did the walkthrough and uh, right there, she wanted us to cancel the showing. You know, we had a few more guys coming and she's like, look, if you do 90, you know, we'll take it right now. And we're like, can we do, you know, you know, can you be 92? Cause we were asking like 93, I think. Got it. Yeah. So, so they just, you know, she really liked it. And I was like, Hey, tell you what, I'll cancel the showing and, and I'll give you the property. I just need you to put down our earnest money. She's like, we'll do that. Here's a check. She wrote us a check on the spot and uh, she took down the deal. That house oh. is actually ready to go to the market probably next month. And, and we've been following that whole entire project. So we know um, how far along she is, some of the battles that she's gone through uh, with that project. I mean, she's making that house look absolutely incredible. I'm very happy about that and actually to be honest Anna, she's going to make a lot of money she's going to she's going to probably sell that like 185 i think with everything that's, that's happened since so what's going to happen at the end of the day right who's she going to want to buy deals from you guys so that, that's yeah that's yeah. that's that no that's you know that's a win-win all around you, you guys provided value to the seller you're making a profit but you also got uh this developer buyer a, a nice property and she's making a ton of money so mm -hmm. um that's amazing. There's, there's yeah. a lot. And obviously we can go on forever. You know, I'm, uh, you know, I wanted to know how sure. you guys, how, you know, how you find buyers and, and all that, but we'll probably do a, a, a round two sure. soon. Uh, sure. Oh man, this was good. Um, well, check this out. And it's like, I got one more thing for you. Go so for it. That, that same seller, like I said, had other properties and yeah. the other property, as soon as we got that transaction done for her and she got paid, um, she was able to get obviously financially relieved, right? She was able to catch up on her rent, any bills that she had behind and, you know, refill the savings account. Uh, but aside from that, she had another property with another tenant that also wasn't paying. So Here yes, that bought her time, but she still had more pain. And um, that property, we also ended up getting on the contract literally like I think two weeks after once she kind of settled in. Um, and we, we're selling that, like I said, pretty much um, should have closed on Friday, but it ended up being pushed to today. But then the seller actually got like a COVID vaccine. So they weren't feeling too great. They just needed a little bit of time. So we're just going to close tomorrow and uh, we're going to make 16,500 on that assignment. So and this that's is from the like same seller? Same seller. Yeah. Wow. So 43,000 from one seller. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah building, you know, and, and you guys, you know, you guys are doing it right. So that, that shows because yeah. you can do one transaction with someone and, and you can, you know, if you are not fair, they'll never call you again. The fact that you guys are doing this over and over again, that, that shows that the process yeah. works and, and you guys are doing it right. Um, mm -hmm. That's also awesome. It's just one seller, right? One opportunity, Ennis. You just got to hit gold one time. That's right. it. But you guys are doing consistently. So that, that's the that kudos to you for that. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, I have so many questions here, but we, you know, probably we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll go for a couple more. Um, for sure. Yeah. Um, what's next for you? I mean, let's, let's wrap it up there. I really want to know sure. what, you know, how you guys are looking at, you know, at the next step and like, what does, let's say, you know, three to six months for you guys look like? Jeez, I don't even want to be that far. And that's going to be crazy <laughs> like, uh, because we've just been building so much momentum. You know, we spent the yeah. time learning sales, learning marketing, putting us, our backs behind the wall, um, just taking the maximum risk uh, and, and, and doing what we have to do. Uh, one thing that we, we have in mind for this year is to hit a million dollars in gross profits. Uh, and considering how lean we are, I think we should be able to net um, over 600,000. So I think that's like a figure that I would have never imagined. Now I do got to split that with two partners, but I also never made 200,000, right? That's, that's also quite a lot of money just for your, you know, it second is. year in business basically. So I think in three to six months, I mean, I, I, I can easily foresee us doing hundred K months on, on a consistent basis. And I only say that because I know my market, I know the data, I know the opportunities that we're executing on. And um, our average assignment right now is like between 25 to 30,000. So, That's you know, we don't need to do amazing. a lot of volume. 
but we, you know, yeah, we just need to keep um, digging up new opportunities every day and um, hiring our team out. We, um, we have three virtual assistants right now that we've brought on over the past month. So we're just kind of getting those roles in place and um, we do all of our cold calling. So we don't even That's let amazing. the VAs do the cold calling because there's a sales component there that we want to be able to like, you know, execute on the first touch. Um, but yeah, just to set, I mean, I think we're going to, we're going to do very well this year. That's amazing. And Claudio, if um, I, I know people that will watch this and I have this conversation with guys all the time, guys and girls uh, that want to get into the business, but they're, um, you know, comfortable at the, at the job they have, or it's hard to really uh, stop the, what they're doing and, and really, you know, uh, jump yeah. into real estate investing. And, and you know, you, I, I love that you shared the story, you know, because it, 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 you were lean and, and you really went cold turkey, right? And just jumped into real estate uh, yeah. all in. But how, you know, by you doing that, like what, what you know, how can people really um, transition? You know, how can they yeah. do it? Yeah, that's a great uh, message to leave you guys with. Uh, for sure. I mean, if you want it bad enough, you're going to have to just do it. You know, your situation's got to determine your, your level of hustle. Uh, because if you're comfortable, there's not going to be any any circumstance there for you to want to actually, you know, get out of that. A lot of people here, especially in, in Massachusetts, you know, you, we have a good life here. And as you know, we um, the average person makes a reasonable amount of money. Uh, we have, you know, ca- ni- nice new cars. Right. We're like just, you know, hanging out with friends. Right. We're thinking about going to the, uh, Cancun or something like that. It's just like there's not a lot of bad, op- bad things happening mm-hmm. to us in general. So I think you got to, first of all, Put yourself in a place where you need, you want this to happen because there's a big difference between wanting and actually needing to do it, right? I had to do it, and but I wanted to do it, right? I became obsessed with the process. So that's the first step, I think, just getting obsessed with it. But you're never going to be obsessed if you're not consistent, if you're not actually taking things seriously. Uh, but yeah, take some risk. You know, I think once you take some risk, you realize it's actually more, more risky to stay at doing what you're doing, right? Once you look at the opportunity and the lifestyle that you, you can have, and the money that you can have. And like, for me, you know, I'm my own boss, right? So it's a lot more empowering to kind of live life on my own terms and not be dependent on, on a schedule or, or what somebody needs from me other than what I need for myself, right? So yeah, I just say, take the risk. You know, if you want to do it, you don't have to quit your job, but you do have to take the, the you know, the 5 to 8 p.m. time very seriously. And then even then you still got to be at it, like, you know, working till midnight. You got to put in as much time as you can because you're at a disadvantage, you know? So just put in that work, believe in yourself, trust the process and, and just never give up. If you never give up, you will 100% succeed. Just don't give up. I love it. Uh, where can people find you? Yeah, so you can reach to uh, you can reach out to me on Instagram. That's probably the best place, uh, or on Facebook. Uh, my Instagram handle is shg underscore Claudio, and uh, on Facebook, uh, you can just look me up Claudio Diaz, and I'm sure I'll pop up as a mutual friend. Awesome. And I'll I'll obviously add this to to the notes here. Yeah, man. I'm I'm glad that we had this conversation. Um, you know, I'm, I'm happy they're doing so well. You know, it's kudos to you for taking the, you know, the the, the step forward and, and doing all that you have done so far. But, you know, just talking to you, I know you have a lot uh, in front of you. So, uh, yeah, yeah. I appreciate it, Dennis. I'm happy to be here. Like I said, you know, looking two years back, <laughs> I, I didn't know if I was going to make it, but uh, I know I wasn't giving up. So there's no uh, question about it. It doesn't matter how long it takes, right? It could take five years. You know, it doesn't take too many um, months for you to make 100K for you to catch up a whole decade anyway. So, Amazing. Awesome, man. I love it. Thank Thank you. you. I appreciate it, man. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.